San Marino Motor Classic. This is the Great Gala at the San Marino Classic at the uh, San Marino Motor Classic. And this is where the parade's going on uh, for some of the most historical vehicles. Um, that they have assembled in this area from a multitude of different collections from all over the world. And each one of the each one of the cars get a um, get a song by the band and you can see the, the marching band is uh, sitting behind the, the stage while all the donors etc are uh, enjoying their dinners and hors d'oeuvres and drinks etc and they're uh, telling the story about um, the car itself and it's quite a quite an interesting little show uh, and you got all of these cars that haven't run <laughs> for quite some while uh, and there's some phenomenal cars coming up the other big old I think there's a packet behind the other one and, you know and some of these cars are uh, there's only one of one and here they go getting the the, the song for it you know. so just hang with me it's going to be a little while you know and, um, between each of them but it is yeah and they're playing a the whole song and they're telling the story for each one of them yeah you'll have plenty of time So yeah, there'll be a song for each. So we'll be here for a little while. Um, but it's really interesting to see these cars uh, going across in their live format, so to say. Oh, he's getting a little hot. Yeah, he knows he's getting a little hot. So. Yep, yep, yep. So, but yeah. It's going to be a fun event here tomorrow. The entire park usually is uh, right. close to full, and all of this will be full, even up in the in the mountains and stuff. Yep, that's Aaron right there. And here he comes. Nineteen fourteen. It's not easy to drive these things. They got all kinds of adjustments and happy stuff. And, uh... Oh, and then we got this big old... Big old motor right here. Wow. We're gonna follow them all, so bear with me. The electrical system had a control unit attached to the steering column, which had switches for the ignition, lights, and horn, an ignition lock, and mixture control for the carburetor. The Model 38 sold for $4,000 to $5,400, and the Touring was the most popular Model 38 body style, and the only open style of the intermediate 138-inch wheelbase. And Aaron wants to say something. Let's give a big a hand for Joe and Janice Consonary won second place in their class last week at Pebble Beach in the Ansel Adams Special Award. Our musical accompaniment for this beautiful Packard is By the Beautiful Sea by Harry Carroll and Harold J. Adderidge. Maestro. Get to feast your eyes. This car is so long, it's like half a block already by the time you get to the door. You know, I was helping him backing up a little bit earlier. He was caught between two vehicles and he's actually number three cars and he was just way back over there. But we got him out. Look at all those lights and the chrome. It's exceptional. Absolutely exceptional car. Yeah, it's heavy too, Tracy. Absolutely. Hey, Johnny. Where are we all hanging at uh, on this beautiful Saturday afternoon? I'm in Lacey Park at the San Marino Motor Classic. Where are you guys hanging? And what are you doing?
you know, you could be at the San Marino Moto Classics, but you're missing out on it. <laughs> so, yeah, we hope it'll be okay. You see it leaked a little bit going in there, so. Oh, we got it going again. Okay, we're gonna have the Packard coming. Oh yeah, can't even hear. What a ride. <laughs> what a ride. All right, here we have a 1931. Here we go, coming in hot. Duesenberg Model J Durham Tourister. Owned by Joseph and Maggie Cassini of West Orange, New Jersey. The Tourister was a legendary was a legendary car designer, Gordon Durham's favorite Duesenberg. With the tourister, Duren also sought to solve a common problem of dual cow pantries of the time. They were often equipped with second windshields to give weather protection to rear seat passengers, but these windshields were mounted on a hinged metal tonneau that had to be clumsily swung up out of the way each time a passenger entered or exited the automobile. The tourister's solution was a rear windshield that slid up and down out of the back of the front seat with the turn of a crank handle. Eight original examples were built in period. All eight survived. The musical composition to go along with this beautiful car is Mood Indigo by Duke Ellington. What a shindig, huh? What a shindig. And they're lining up behind. And it's cool too, because um, I think the last one in the road, or the closest of the area is that seven, eight, nine, that, uh, they built the final one that they built at NTA when I was there. It was pretty exceptional. Oh. This thing, I love this thing. Patina rules in, uh, in uh, the concourse too. <laughs> you just call it something different, you know. See them all crawling up there. I love the worn tire on the spare, you know. for some skilled driving in an absolutely beautiful car. Yeah. Here comes our next car as we're on way for it. We're moving up from composition is The Mooch by the legendary Duke Ellington.
fantastic collection of cars. Huh? I know it's not hot rods and customs and cruising and that type of stuff, but every now and then you gotta do something different and this sure is different. And there he goes. All right, our next car is a 1931 Marmon V16 sedan. Now, you might recognize the, the name Marmon because 20 years prior to the building of this car, they won the first game of the sky. The owners of this car were Marmon Brothers, and they were actually the owners of this car. They were Stephen Plaster from Lebanon, Missouri. Fewer than 400 Marmon 16s were built before the company ceased automobile production in 1933 just two years after this car. And of these, roughly 75 remain today, including an estimated six LeBaron body coupes. Marmon's overhead valve, 491 cubic inch V16, was rated at an impressive 200 horsepower. Pretty incredible for 1931. At 930 pounds assembled, the Marmon engine was relatively light, reportedly enabling the 16 to out-accelerate a Duesenberg Model J for roughly a third of the price. Unfortunately for Marmon, the project didn't remain secret long enough. Engineer Owen Knacker was lured away by Cadillac, which developed a V16 of its own for the 1930 model year. Our musical composition is Good Night, Sweetheart, composed by Ray Noble, Jimmy Campbell, and Reg Conley. Look at the vents on the side, chrome mesh, hood on the vent. Look at that. The, those lights, they actually move with the steering wheel or with the wheel. So when you turn to the left, they'll turn to the left and kind of uh, shine the light into the turn as you go. That's a, quite a feature for the 30s, you know. Safety first. <laughs> Just gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. We got so much more coming too. Hopefully, I have battery for all of it. <laughs> We're always happy with it. We're always happy when the car starts and can leave the ramp. Otherwise, the program's going to get really boring when they keep playing the same song over and over again. Our next beautiful vehicle is a 1933 Juicenberg SJ convertible sedan owned by Jeannie and Rob Villarides of Visalia, California. The model SJ is a supercharged version of the Model J, but has 320 horsepower. The supercharger is located beside the engine with exhaust pipes exiting to the side panel of the hood to increase tunes. The name SJ was never used by Duesenberg Company to reference these models, but we know it now as the SJ. Even though the Model J had received much attention from the press and promotional material was well circulated, sales were disappointing. The Duesenberg Company had hoped to build 500 examples per year, but only 481 were built. Bought by celebrities like Gary Cooper, Clark Gable, Greta Garbo, and Jimmy Cagney, Monarchs, Kings, Queens, and the very wealthy accounted for the rest of those 481 sales. Aaron, you've got one more thing to add, don't you? You know, this car last week won uh, second in his class at Pebble Beach. Let's give him a big hand. Wow. Also, this is one of 24 SJs ever made. All right, I'm going to sneak back around. 
Let me come back around here. Oh, we got that running around over there. We're going to come in on the other side. That's a 37 Darren. I was talking to the guy earlier, and he said that was a, um, the first car Darren built around here before he started production on his happy stuff over here in LA. I'm going to give you a couple of different views. We can sneak out over here too. I think you can get a sneak peek of the other ones coming. Oh no, too much stuff. All right, I tried. <laughs> Let's come around on the other side. Get a little different view of the shindy here. I just love the setting. Sounds so good. Heavy rumble to it. <laughs> Our next car is a 1934 Auburn 1250 V12 convertible sedan. Owned by Barbara and Fred Lox of Malibu, California. What a surviving of only 27 of the rare Auburn V12 Phantom Salon still. The convertible was the top of the line model that emerged from the Floundry Auburn Automobile Company at a plant in Depression Plague, Auburn, Indiana, which you can tour the beautiful museum there today in the actual plant. At an original cost of $1,745, it is powered by a life homing engine displacing 391 cubic inches, featuring twin carburetors, dual exhaust, dual ratio, two speed, Columbia rear axle. Boy, that really made a difference, too. Uh, this car features a beautifully finished two-tone head cleaning exterior paint design with an authentic modern trunk. The car also has an original rear fill code transit. Thank you, Jerry. Radio. Hey, Guido. Hey, Frank. Amazing. I'm trying not to interfere with the communication here, but... Moonglow, composed by Betty Goodman. Thirty-seven Darren, followed by a Delahaye. What more can you ask for on a Saturday night? set on the dash of this car was every hot rodder's dream to have an Auburn dash that you'd set in on a 32 Ford. Tomorrow you got to check it out and you'll see what I mean. 
Our next four-wheel treasure is a 1936 Packard Series 1404 convertible owned by Paul Whitney. In 84 years of existence, the car has only had five owners. It was sold new in 1935 by Packard Motor Car Company of Boston. The current owner, Paul Whitney, purchased it in 2017. A one and a half year restoration was done and completed in time for its debut at the 2019 San Marino Motor Classic, where it won best in class and a special award for best paint and body. In March 2020, at the San Diego Palm Springs Grand Classic, it was judged a 100 point car and received its senior CCCA award. The car is happily driven at least twice a month around the neighborhood and apparently has become the favorite ride of the grandchildren, especially in the rumble seat. Our musical composition is one you all may know, Pennies from Heaven by Arthur Johnson and Johnny Burke, and made famous by Bing Crosby. <laughs> Thing is so long, <laughs> so round, so beautiful. Yeah, we'll get back to that one. Next car, 1937 Ford, Darren and Herman Jr. What a uh, what a beautiful grill on this car. Owned by Richard Atwell of Fredericksburg, Texas. Fredericksburg is the home of Admiral Chester Nimitz. Some of you will know who I'm talking about. Howard Dutch Darren was a leading American designer of custom body cars in the classic era. He's remembered for the custom bodies he designed for luxury cars from Duesenberg to Rolls Royce. In particular, he is noted for the many Packard Darrens he built for movie stars, such as Clark Gable and Errol Flynn. This Ford Model 78 convertible was the first car built in the United States by Darren after he moved to Los Angeles from Paris. It was based on the Model 78 Deluxe and giving a distinctive grille and headlights. Power was from the 60 horsepower Ford V8, which you couldn't give away back then, the Ford V8 60. It was a smaller economy motor and America wasn't ready for it. There were over 57,000 examples of the Ford in both standard and deluxe trim during 1937, but this is the only one with this style of coachwork. It is the only Darren designed car ever built on a Ford chassis, and with that 60 motor makes it very, very rare and unique. Our musical composition, One O'Clock Jump by Count Basie. Yeah, I drove over inside there earlier 
video but just uh you take the body line right there this hand stamp in there and the flush fitted skirts all the little extra trim pieces just fantastic it's just pure art pure art on wheels and you got a, what is that a 49 48 49 packet behind there Owned by, well, let's just call him the one and only Mike, Mark Hyman of St. Louis, Missouri. What a gorgeous car. This is what we all drew when we figured out the French curve in the high school drafting class. For the 1936 Paris Auto Salon, Joseph Pigoni decided to build a unique automobile that would showcase his vision of the outer limits of modern car design as well as the skills of his craftsmen. Pagoni's car was like nothing ever seen before, and it caused a sensation at the Paris Salon. Soon there was enough demand for a limited run of 11 cars based on the initial design. This is one of three torpedo cabriolets built on the Delahaye short wheel base 135 competition chassis and is one of two known survivors. In 2000, it won Best in Show at the 50th anniversary of the Pebble Beach Concord Elegance. And let's get ready to tap your toes. Our musical composition is Sing, Sing, Sing by Louis Prima. coming in behind convertible there goes the Delahaye I was wrong. After 1946. World War II, the War Powers Act was repealed in 1946, and American car manufacturers were faced with huge demand for cars from returning soldiers. The demand for automobiles was answered by using pre-war designs and tooling until new models could be designed for the following model year. This 1946 Packard was one of the those cars that was constructing using pre-war sheet metal and tooling. Like many cars of the era, its designers took design cues from military aircraft, such as its raked windshield and sloping roofline. This Packard was recently treated to a complete frame-off restoration by Custom Auto Service in Santa Ana, California. It's owned by Paul Rusnick, 
sponsor of the show from Pasadena, California. And Paul's dad, I found out tonight, was a Packer dealer overseas. Distributor. Distributor. Oh, I'm a golf ball distributor when I play golf. <laughs> no, that's amazing. The musical composition is Route 66, composed by Bobby Troop. What a car. but it seems like an eternity as far as car design. Our next beautiful car is a 1950 Oldsmobile Rocket 88 convertible. World War II was behind us and they could design sleek looking cars again. For 1949, Oldsmobile's futuramic wide body style was extended across the model range. The design was Oldsmobile's first one post World War II with flow through fenders crowned by a high set headlights. Of course, the big news was the new Rocket 88 overhead valve V8 engine which displaced 303 cubic inches and developed 135 horsepower. At the last minute, a new 88 series was introduced using the new V8 in the small 70 series body. The result was electrifying for the day with 0 to 60 in 12.2 seconds and a 19.9 second quarter mile. Clear plastic hood panels were an option, though obviously not very practical. In 1950, an Olds 88 convertible paced the Indy 500. A uh, musical combination, uh, composition, pardon me, Luck Be a Lady by Frank Loser from the musical Guys and Dolls. <laughs> one in an earlier video too. Chassis, a 190, W9, 194 chassis, 300 SL. I guess this is body number five. If you look at the plate right there. But it's pure, pure racing pedigree. I was listening to that one uh, rumbling around earlier when they were coming in through the park with the doors wide open. Quite an experience. Got the real knockoff wheels, got the exhaust coming out of the side. You can see it like right there under the door is where the exhaust coming out. We got the, the strap on the hood, you know, and they even taped the door handle so they wouldn't accidentally come up in bumps and stuff. So the Olds is leaving the scene. And we got this happy one coming in. 
Uh oh. There we go. Oh yeah. I can smell the gas from here. successes of the race car, you have to think about Germany, after the war, they had no means to do anything. They took a bunch of parts and they created a new car out of that in a lightweight body that coined the phrase SL, super light, and they went racing with that car and they were victorious with that car. This particular car ran the Carrera Panamericana, that's the livery that it has right here, finished spot two, ran at Le Mans, it is the actual car and a car that we have preserved all along in our factory collection. The Carrera Panamericana was a race in Mexico that was crazy on the highways. And the people in Mexico would stand in front of the cars. And there's video, I mean video film, of the people from overhead splitting at the last moment as these cars were running at over 100 miles an hour. It was crazy. It was like it was bullfighting. Anyway, this is an amazing car, Michael. An amazing car to have here, and we love the car. It's remarkably easy to drive. I had the pleasure of driving it down Highway 1 back and forth about 20 times last week. Not a bad job. Uh, but uh, really, really fun and very, very capable and something quite amazing out of something very simple. This was based on a luxury sedan engine, this car. So quite amazing. Dave, what's the song? Only Aaron knows the song. Actually, our maestro knows the song. American Bandstand Boogie. There we go. There you go. We all know that one. <laughs> I still don't know what country this was made in, but behind it we have uh, the N2A 789 coming up. And uh, it was built at the N2A, uh, no two alike. What a journey it was working in that awesome facility. That is actually one of the last cars coming out of that facility. And it was a pure joy to see you here today. Mercedes Benz. There we go, they got a beautiful dealership right there in Arcadia, California. Our next car. Uh, this is the 1957 oh, yes. Chevrolet. No, this oh. is a 1957 Romech Biscow, owned by Shadar Bosis and Celeste Papas Bosis of close by in La Cañada. This is a three seat cabriolet that was handcrafted by Romech. Coachworks in Berlin and named after its designer, Johann Bisco. Produced between 1950 and 1957, they were considered the Volkswagen for high society. Oh, wait, I thought that was a Porsche. The very first one was sold to the King of Sweden, and others were driven by celebrities such as Gregory Peck and Aubrey, Audrey Hepburn. The Romech Volkswagens were constructed entirely by hand using a steel frame covered by a lightweight aluminum skin. The aluminum bodied sports car was never officially blessed by Wolfsburg. After 1954, VW refused to supply the long-established coach builders with the rolling chassis and other parts needed. So get this, they were forced to buy complete VWs via sneakily through their 50 employees and just go get an off-the-showroom floor <laughs> folks like to take apart and then make it into this. Our musical composition is, fittingly, All Shook Up by Elvis Presley. Bless my soul, what's wrong with me? 
I met you like a man on a bus street. My friends say I'm a queer, but I mean, I'm all shook up. Ah, uh -huh. uh -huh. hey, yeah. Oh, my friends are coming in for me. I can't choose to say I'm on my own. I'm going to have to go back to the house. So, Mr. Langham, I built these uh, at N2A. Um, out of Cadillacs, uh, Corvettes, or Camaros. And this one, if I remember correctly, and don't quote me this, but it's either a 2019 or 2020 Camaro convertible that they put a uh, all new body on to look like a 57 Chevy in the front, 58 in the back, and 59 in the rear. Or I should say 58 in the middle, and 59 in the rear on an all late model uh, Camaro chassis body, you know. Kind of the best of both worlds. You made quite a few of them in various formats and various levels of design. I think this is the third design version of this one. And it's the one I personally like the best. It has the right length and the right lines. I wish I could buy one. <laughs> It is such a cool little car. The Chevy is a combination of the front end of a 57, the side of a 58, and the tail of a 59 Impala. Look at this thing. All on the platform of a 2019 Camaro SS convertible, which means this car has some real oomph. Camaro SS really is just like a Corvette car near, same motor. It just has a couple extra seats. Uh, most of the, all the body parts are discarded on the donor vehicle. A new wider front end, hood, quarter panels, trunk, and back end are fitted to the vehicle. Moreover, all materials are composite. The factory black interior has been replaced with gray leather and gray on gray houndstooth fabric and the two-tone colors of the car are Ferrari Gray and Audi VW Mellow Yellow. The 789 was, because of the 57, 58, 59, the 789 was designed and built by N2A Motors. No two cars are alike. That's what the name means, N2A. Of Anaheim by Gene Langmesser. Fantastic. The song is Mac the Knife. And that's what happened to this, those cars. They were cut up by Mac the Knife. Composer, Kurt Weil Lyricist. Then we had a beautiful Chevrolet Impala, the real thing, dressed in white. by a Ferrari. What more can you ask for? A little bit of Americana. A little bit of custom. A little bit of coach work. A little bit of one-off. A little bit of everything. At the San Marino Motor Classic in Lacey Park, San Marino, just south of Pasadena in Southern California. Been quite a day for a setup day, huh? Today is one of those days that I let the cars and the action happening around us speak for most of itself. Uh, hope you guys are enjoying it. I know it's not the, like our regular coverage, but uh, I do enjoy seeing this little parade. There's going to be so much more tomorrow. The main show is here tomorrow, all day at uh, uh, 
Lacey Park. So if you feel like coming, this whole park will be full. I mean, there's acres and acres of every car imaginable. It was one of the best selling cars in North America at the time. It remained as one of the top selling vehicles in the U.S. for many years. The full size Chevrolets were completely redesigned for 1963, featuring two crisply defined horizontal body side character lines in place of the diagonal accents featured on the 62s. This numbers matching Chevrolet Impala has been treated to a frame off restoration using all NOS or new old stock parts. Our musical composition is. What Kind of Fool Am I? <laughs> by Leslie Griffiths and Anthony Newley and as performed famously by Sammy Davis Jr. What kind of fool am I? And I think the Ferrari will be the end of this. It seems and that if the battery goes dead, because I can't see how much battery I have left, but we've been filming for quite a while, so bear with us if it goes out. But I think we'll be okay. It's cool, the equipment is working, but if it cuts out, you know I love you all, and I appreciate you hanging with us here, but we'll run this one out until this one goes to the stage, and then I'll be back tomorrow. So, I, for all of you that are still here, I really appreciate it, because... It's a lot of work hauling this thing around, but it is enjoyable to see this stuff. It's not uh, that often that you get to uh, watch such a unique uh, combination of vehicles go on a parade on a gala like this at San Marino Motor Classic. And there, most of this gala is to sponsor and or support the Pasadena uh, Humane Society and SPCA. Um, and this is uh, one of their main uh, a charity events, so that's part of it. So, anyway, I wanted to mention that too. Hopefully, it's like being here, you know, a little bit. Well, if you were here, you'd be sitting over there and you only get one angle <laughs> as they come through. But we try to give you a little bit more of the full experience, so to say, of the cars coming in and out, because that's what most of you guys are enjoying, so to say, you know? What a stunning, stunning car. This was a car that populated driveways across America for years and years. Thank you so much. What a beautiful job. And I'm, I kind of have OCD on details. We even have the, the Paramount Chevrolet license plate frame around the period correct 1963 California black plates. The devil's in the details. Congratulations and thank you so much. Beautiful. And it's got the Sentinel auto dimmer up on the dash there, too. The headlight dimmer, which was a really big deal back then. And of course, that rear center speaker grill, you know, we had a palace when I was a kid, and you would dare your little brother to touch it in the summer. Because it was about as hot as a, a grill. Our next car is a 1971 Ferrari 265 S4 Daytona Spider, owned by David Lee in California. David is our and his company, Hinghua Lee Jewelers, are presenting sponsor tonight. And he is driving the car right there. At the 1969 Frankfurt Motor Show, the world finally got to see the latest Ferrari Spider, the 365 GTS 4. The engine was the same V12 unit used in the Berlinetta with a displacement of 4.4 liters to produce a generous 352 horsepower at 7,500 RPM. A Daytona Spider was a special proposition from day one. Of the 1,406 Ferrari Daytonas produced, only a mere 121 were built as 365 GTS Spiders by Ferrari, the ultimate prancing horse status symbol of the time. This stunning Ferrari 365 is a four-time Platinum Award winner at Cavallino and is shown in its original color of fly yellow. And I'll also add that in 1972, the next year after this car, a coupe Ferrari Daytona won the 24 Hours of Daytona, which is what it was named after. Our musical composition is Bridge Over Troubled Water, recorded by Art Garfunkel. <laughs>
to thank you all for hanging with us through this presentation of the gala and the parade of cars uh, with music and everything uh, at the San Marino Motor Classic in Pasadena, or in San Marino, California, which is a little bit south of Pasadena. And I hope you come and join us tomorrow uh, for more coverage of the cars and stuff. And there'll be pictures and stuff following that over the weeks coming. Love y'all. See you tomorrow. Thanks again. See ya.